Anyway, uh, so first of all, welcome, Penguin. Pleasure to oh, thank you. Anyway, pleasure to have you. Uh, before we begin proceedings, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of the land of which we're meeting, which is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects uh, to their uh, their culture and their custodian of the Australian country and extend my appreciation and respect to their leaders, both past, present and emerging. Uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, Feng Wang to our Meet the Author seminar series. So Feng Wang is a, is a lecturer in, in the chemical and also apparently the biomolecular engineering department. Uh, he's been a part of the University of Sydney since 2020. Uh, and his research aims for a greener carbon neutral future uh, relying on electrochemical engineering. Uh, Dr. Lee has over 70 research articles published in top tier journals. And to me, even this was a bit daunting looking at the esteemed lists that I actually saw of Nature Science, American Chemical Society, and this really goes on. Uh, it is a, a great pleasure to have someone who's also one of our grand challenge leaders as part of Sydney Nano, and they're excited to see how it progresses over the next two years. And I wish you all the best in that project. And I'd like to, to hand over now and uh, begin your presentation on catalysts and devices for CO2 electrical. Thank you, Nick, for the kind of introduction. And thank you, Sydney uh, Nano, for the invitation to present my recent research progress in catalysis and devices for CO2 electrolysis. So the reason we are doing CO2 electrolysis is under the background of carbon capture and the storage. So usually uh, we uh, use the term CCS to stand for carbon capture and the storage. So in that concept, we will capture CO2 either from uh, directly from air or from uh, power, uh, power sources uh, like power plants. Then we bury the CO2 underground or under sea. But the biggest challenge for this technology is that the buried CO2 does not have value. So we just need to spend money to bury the CO2 and the CO2 will uh, stay hopefully forever underground, but we create nothing from the CO2. Actually, CO2 is actually the largest carbon source for, uh, for the Earth. If we can somehow utilize the CO2, we will have the chance to replace fossil fuel as the carbon source, but now we use CO2 as a carbon source to create some chemicals and fuels to like sustain our uh, uh, development of society. So this has the new concept of CCUS, which means carbon capture, utilization, and the storage. So our CO2 electrolysis lies in the space of utilization. So here is the schematic for this concept. So what we do is that so we recycle, we capture the CO2 from uh, industrial power emissions, and then we use renewable electricity and water to convert the CO2 into some chemicals and the fields. In the device, we call electrochemical CO2 conversion or CO2 electrolysis. So in this device, we can combine, we can combine water and the CO2 and the renewable electricity to the products that we want so that the product can be further utilized in buildings, transportation, or other chemical uh, sectors so that we can form a closed carbon cycle. So in a closed carbon cycle, we do not emit any more CO2, but we achieve carbon neutral uh, overall. So there are several advantages for our CO2 electrolysis compared to other traditional thermal uh, catalysis-based uh, technologies, for example, the reaction can operate under room temperature or low temperature and the ambient pressure so that we don't need to have any uh, setup to heat up the uh, reaction or to pressurize the whole system. And also it's naturally uh, compatible with the renewable electricity. The uh, good thing, another good thing if we can combine with the renewable electricity is that uh, Currently, we can generate a lot of renewable electricity from solar panels, from wind farm, but how to store them 
is a big challenge. You are using the batteries like Tesla has offered to South Australia, we can only achieve like overnight storage of uh, electricity. But if we want to achieve seasonal energy storage, battery is not an option. So if we can convert CO2 into some energy containing molecule like um, natural gas, uh, like uh, ethanol, we can achieve seasonal energy storage. And uh, it's very easy to transport these materials because we have already the uh, established infrastructure like uh, LNG ships uh, and uh, like pipelines for uh, liquid fuel uh, transportation. And also it's easy to scale up for this device. You don't need to build uh, like a giant power, uh, power uh, giant plant like uh, Hubble Bosch uh, process for ammonia synthesis. You can only, uh, you can need uh, to build a, a device size just similar as Toyota uh, fuel cars um, in that size. And once once you want to scale up the process, you just need to build a stack of uh, stacks of the device so that we can um, speed up the commercialization processes. So here, some basics for the CO2 electrolysis. So the key reaction in the CO2 electrolysis is CO2 reduction reaction. So in the in this reaction, uh, because it's a reduction reaction, it happens at the cathode. CO2 accepts electrons and combine with water to generate the uh, pro product we desire. And uh, um, because of the, like uh, and the, the the mass balance, we generate uh, OH ions and. Uh, uh, in order for the electron to form a closed circuit at the uh, anode, we have the reaction of water uh, oxidation reaction. So in which the OH lose electron to become oxygen and uh, water, we call it uh, oxygen evolution reaction because it generates oxygen. So for the CO2 uh, reduction, which is our focus, actually it's very complicated. The biggest uh, uh, complication is that uh, CO2 had a uh, reduction has a low selectivity towards the product we desire. Actually, CO2 can reduction can generate as many as 16 different uh, uh, products ranging from carbon monoxide, formic acid, all the way to methanol, ethanol, and uh, ethylene by accepting different amounts of a different number of electron, electrons. So, so how can we tune the selectivity of CO2 RR to the product we want? It's a big challenge. So in the past several years, we have been doing a lot of work in developing some new nanomaterial catalysts to achieve uh, the high selectivity and of course high activity for the CO2 R reaction. For example, we do uh, we modify the uh, nanostructure of the uh, material. We use some uh, composite material, or we generate some like a specific morphology of the material to utilize some. Uh, uh, physical phenomenon to help us harness more energy and uh, improve the selectivity. So uh, for nanomaterial, definitely we need to uh, put some more effort and uh, we have been continuously putting effort to this. But uh, today, uh, what I would like to share with you is uh, another story. So uh, many of us know that a single atom has been a hot topic in recent years. Uh, single atom can find uh, uh, applications, you know, a uh, very range, uh, broader range of uh, different reactions, including thermal reactions, bio reactions, and electro uh, catalysis, of course. So one recent example is that uh, some researchers in France have developed a copper-based single atom uh, catalyst supported on nitrogen doped carbon uh, material. So what they found is that uh, beyond the, the single carbon product, which sing, uh, single atom uh, catalyst usually generates, they can they identify quite a number of ethanol in their products. So we know ethanol is a C2 product. So it's CH3, C, uh, CH2OH. So it's a multi-carbon product. So uh, whether single at single diet catalyst can catalyze the C2 Two product production actually is a mystery because we cannot kind of understand how this happens. So here is the widely accepted mechanism for the C2 product generation. So starting from CO2 accepting uh, protons and electrons, it needs to go to a step uh, or an intermediate called uh, CO. So only by coupling two CO or uh, COH sometimes we can generate uh, C2 
intermediate, and the C2 intermediate actually is the starting point for us to generate the C2 products. Otherwise, we can only generate the C1 products. So we needed to have at least two active sites to bind such CO, CO intermediate so that we can have chances for them to uh, couple it. But for the single site catalyst, we theoretically, theoretically we only have one active site. But that means it's almost possible to generate a C2 product. Indeed, so how does the single item catalyst work? We found that under in situ condition, that means under CO2 reduction working conditions, they put the, their material in the uh, X-ray adsorption spectroscope, spectroscopy, uh, which allow them to identify the proper uh, oxidation state and the coordination environment. They found that uh, under applied potential, uh, we, uh, we can see they see that before electrolysis, we can only identify copper nitrogen bound. But under applied potential, they found that uh, the copper nitrogen bound decreases while all, at the same time, the copper copper bond increases. That means during reaction and the re reaction conditions, the single atom is not a single atom anymore. They aggregate into copper nanocluster so that they have copper copper bond. And uh, what uh, is kind of like mag magic is that uh, when they put uh, the catalyst out of the CO2 reaction and put uh, exposed into air for 10 hours, they found that the copper copper bond disappeared while the copper nitrogen bond reappeared. So they think that uh, um, there are some like uh, reasons to for to reverse the process back to single atom after reaction. That means if we really want to understand uh, the catalyst catalytical site, we need to operate the reaction and uh, Examine the re examine the reaction and uh, operating conditions so that we can get the real information for the catalysis, not only to characterize the post electrolysis samples because it will uh, give us misleading information. Actually, this uh, several more examples had uh, appeared after this work and uh, using different material like uh, oxygen uh, coordinates, uh, copper or morph and the cough, they found the similar things. That is, even if it's single atom catalyst in your precursor or pre uh, or prior electrolysis material and the operating conditions, they become copper nanoclusters instead of a single atom. So that the copper nanoparticle is actually the real catalyst during the reaction. So actually, this is not uh, so difficult to understand because for the single atom, the copper copper distance is quite far away. It's very difficult for two CO2 couple together to form the OCCO intermediate for C2 product. But once the copper uh, cluster formed when, uh, from the single atom copper, the copper copper distance is quite close. This allows two CO intermediate to couple together to become the uh, uh, intermediate for C2 product. And uh, this is actually just a one example. Uh, to uh, to um, indicate how we can form the copper aggregation. So under uh, electrochemical reducing conditions, uh, the single atom will form copper nanoclusters, but after uh, removing the uh, electrochemical reducing conditions, it reverse back into the copper nanoparticle, which is exactly the working uh, principle for this uh, paper. So we are wondering, if we can get single site copper, that means even if under operating conditions, the single site copper does not aggregate into copper nanoclusters, while even if they are single atom, they can promote C2 product. That means the CO intermediate on the surface of two isolated copper sites can couple together. So that means we need to create isolated while neighboring sites to enable two CO intermediate to couple together. So we set out to uh, try to find uh, that material. Uh, our starting point is this material copper BTA molecule. Uh, the reason we use this one is that uh, we are thinking um, if we can find uh, a chemical that is uh, 
ultra stable during electrochemical reducing condition, that means it may not undergo like aggregation of copper from like single sites into the copper nanoparticles. So we choose the, the BTA ligand, which is the anti chlorine uh, reagent. So the reading it's it's anti uh, anti chlorine is that uh, the combination or the coordination ability between this BTA molecule and the copper is super, super strong. So it's difficult to reduce the uh the molecular so that the this molecule can form a very dense uh, layer on top of the surface to protect the, the copper from further uh, growing. So we are thinking that this material may be stable under electrochemical reducing conditions. So we synthesize this material by Yu Xiang and uh, Yu Yang uh, to um, my PhD student. And uh, actually the synthetic uh, root is very easy. You just mix them together and the room temperature and the alkaline conditions you will uh, form this uh, very uh, nice uh, nanowire morphology. So first uh, we use electrochemical uh, CV uh, characterization for characterizing this material. We found that uh, and uh, even under very negative uh, applied potential and under very large current density, we cannot uh, see the reduction peak of this material. Of course, we cannot see the corresponding oxidation peak of this material. And we checked the SEM image of this material, uh, of the catalyst after reaction. And we found that uh, the nanowire morphology uh, remains. And uh, we analyzed the product uh, for the CO2 reduction using this material. And indeed, we observed quite a number of C2 products with high selectivity. And, uh, even after the reaction, if we check just simply check the color of the uh, catalyst, it will remain the dark blue color. If you are working with copper, you know that copper is usually showing like a reddish color. So if you reduce the material to form copper nanoparticle, it's, 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 uh, it was expected that you will generate some uh, reddish color. So it's kind of... Uh, sim uh, stable if we just uh, using uh, our bare eyes to look, but we want to characterize the material and the operating condition to see whether it's really stable during working conditions. So before doing that, we need to identify or clarify the structure of the uh, copper BTA molecule. So we use uh, several different uh, uh, spectroscopic uh, approaches to uh, characterize the, the structure of the material using like uh, uh, X-ray absorption, exact uh, things. And also we are using uh, XRD to um, learn the structure and to model the structure. So finally we get to the, uh, the, 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 the actual, I call it the best guess structure of this molecular. The reason we call it best guess structure and not directly call it structure because we do not have the single crystal uh, data to support the structure, but uh, uh, this structure uh, shows great uh, agreement for all the experiment data and also it's consist uh, is uh, like in line with uh, previous literature reports. So let's look at the structure of this molecule. So of course the um, these dots are copper atoms and you can see along this line along this line it's coordinated by BTA molecule and across this line, uh, so two atoms is bridged by OH uh, groups. The distance between two atoms along this direction is around 5.7 angstrom, and the distance uh, in this direction is about uh, 3.8 uh, angstrom. So just uh, have a rough idea of the distance here because we will be talking about it uh, in a later time. So. Then we uh, had to uh, synchrotron resources to examine our uh, uh, like uh, uh, molecular structure and the uh, real uh, application conditions. So we use our homemade uh, in situ cells uh, to do experimental uh, in Taiwan synchrotron, in uh, uh, Australian synchrotron, in Melbourne. So we get the uh, in situ results, exams. So this actually shows the copper nitrogen and the copper oxygen coordination. And uh, in this area, if we have copper-copper, 
this area should have a peak. And we found that under a very wide range of applied potential, we did not observe any copper copper uh, coordination. What we observe is only copper nitrogen and the copper oxygen um, signal. So, but actually, uh, some researchers have pointed uh, that uh, the in situ XAS cannot provide uh, exclusive um, evidence because uh, this signal may be affected by some distort distortion or uh, defect of the material. So we uh, sought to use additional uh, spectroscopic methods to um, do in situ measurement to prove the stability of our material. So our first thing is to do in situ Raman. So all these peaks are related to the copper BKA molecular. Um, and we found that in the different applied potential, we did not observe the disappearance of these peaks. Of course, copper does not have a Raman signal, so we cannot uh, detect the copper. So um, uh, this is uh, easy to understand. And also we provide further evidence using an in situ IR uh, infrared uh, spectroscopy. So this is kind of indirect evidence. Let me explain to you. So in this here, we can see at around uh, about 2000, uh, uh, we number we uh, we observe a peak which is uh, ascribed to the atop CO and uh, so if we know the CO adsorption on metals on metal or on any other subject usually CO has two different type of adsorption configuration one is the bridge CO another is a top CO so the bridge CO requires the CO to be bound by two atoms. And the top CO means that the CO only bound uh, only bound on one atoms. So if we have the bridge CO, we can definitely see that we have a uh, nanocrust formed so that the copper copper is so close to each other, we can have the bridge CO. But what we observe is only a top CO. That means we do not have the two atom, two copper atoms that is so close to, uh, to each other. So hopefully you can. Uh, be convinced that our material is stable during operating conditions. But the next thing is that how, um, how, uh, what's the principle for this material to be stable during uh, operating conditions? Because for most copper based coordination uh, compounds, they are not stable and electrochemically reducing conditions. In our case, copper, the, mo the molecular copper BTA is stable. So uh, what's the rating? So if we, we actually, this come from uh, like a, an accident because, uh, not an accident, but uh, come from something wrong because we, the students, uh, when they try to do the CO2 reduction, they use argon instead of CO2. They, so they did not observe any um, products, uh, which is obvious because you don't have CO2. But uh, what they observe that is that when they disassemble the, cell we are using to measure the performance, they found that the material changed from dark blue color into dark red color and and the uh, argon atmosphere. And when we put the catalyst into XRD uh, crystallization, they found the typical peaks for copper 111. So that means under argon conditions, the copper BPA molecular is not stable. It turned out to be a uh, metallic copper. So we put the, uh, this material into further characterization using some in situ, uh, in situ techniques, like uh, here, the in situ XES, in situ Raman, in situ uh, IR. We found that uh, at a constant applied, uh, applied current of 200 milliampere per centimeter square, the, the mo molecular became copper, metallic copper even within uh, six minutes. And the uh, and the argon atmosphere, we can see the peak uh, um, attributed to copper BTA disappeared uh, along with time and applied potential. And also here in the uh, in situ IR spectroscope, uh, we observe not only a top CO but we observe the bridge CO. So that means it forms a uh, copper aggregation. So now we already know that CO2 plays a role to stabilize the material, but how the CO2 stabilize the structure? And also, we still need to answer the question, how CT coupling takes place on this uh, isolated uh, copper site? So we uh, seek assistance from DFT calculations. 
So the DFT collaborators help us uh, calculate the reaction pathway uh, on computer, uh, and they found uh, that the rate determining step, uh, which determines um, how fast the reaction can go, is actually the CO hydrogenation step to form the CHO. And after the formation of CHO, they found that the coupling of CHO on one upper atom with CO intermediate on its neighboring copper atom is the most energetically favorable way to form a intermediate of OCCHO. So the OCCHO is like the intermediate towards the C2 uh, pathway. So once you form this, all the uh, reaction pathway in the, in the next steps are downhill. So we, I do not put here. So we can kind of understand the, the CC coupling actually happens on two neighboring copper atoms, but uh, then how so to stabilize the structure? So in order to answer this question, we analyze the C, the copper copper distance of the, the neighboring copper sites. We found that in the Princeton molecule is five, around 5.7 and strong, uh, if you recall the number, uh, and uh, with the adsorption of CO intermediate, CHO intermediate, OCCO, uh, OCCHO intermediate along this reaction pathway, we can find that uh, the copper copper distance does not uh, change um, uh, considerably. That means in order to accommodate uh, the CO2 intermediate for the reaction to happen, the structure does not need to undergo very severe uh, change um, so that uh, uh, the material can remain in uh, stable, stable conditions. So that means there is no driving force for the um, material to change its structure and to form the aggregations. And also we analyze the charge density uh, during reaction. And we found that once the, the, the molecule or the, or the copper accepts one electron, uh, the electron is, uh, is favorable to be transferred further into CO2 reduction, uh, CO2 intermediate. That means the electron does not aggregate on the surface of copper to reduce copper, so that uh, we can uh, actually speed up the reaction. So some take home messages. So hopefully uh, you can uh, learn that uh, in the previous reports, in order for the CO2 reduction to form C2 product on single size catalyst, you need to form copper aggregation. For this and the copper aggregation is actually the real active site for this reaction. But what we have done is that we have developed a new coordination, coordination polymer with single site copper and it remains stable during CO2 reduction reaction. And the reason why this single site copper can form C2 product is that we have neighboring copper sites with suitable distance and the CO and the CHO intermediate can couple together to form the final uh, uh, C2 product. So someone asked us the performance, that means uh, now you already have copper, why do you need to have a new catalyst to, uh, to, to study? So the reason is that we pursue better performance for C2 uh, product. So if we compare our catalyst of copper BTA compared to the copper nanoparticle control, we can uh, here maybe more speed forward, we can find that the uh, product, uh, production rate for C2 products, including uh, ethylene, actually doubles the product, production rate of uh, carbon nanoparticles. So what's the impact for this material or for our general generally CO2 electrolysis material is that currently we are evaluating the material using our flow cell reactor uh, here in Sydney. So the active area is actually only one centimeter square. And if we do the calculation using this production rate, and we find that we can only convert 3.2 kilo CO2, kilogram CO2 per year. So this is quite low because you, our goal is actually to convert all the carbon emissions in Australia, which is around 400 megaton in a year to uh in order to like reduce CO2 uh, emissions uh with uh, like a significant outcome. So how can we achieve this goal ambi 
ambitious goal. So from this small device into the large device. So we do the simple calculation. So if we want to convert all the CO2 emissions in Australia, we need to build a, a reactor with a similar size of MCG. Using one reactor, we can convert 0.4 megaton CO2 per year. If we have a thousand of MCG size the electrolyzer, we can convert all the CO2 emissions. So but we start from one centimeter square. So how can we upscale the reaction? So now we are developing our uh, MEA device, which is the membrane electrode assemble device, which is the most promising device in actually, it has already been commercialized in fuel cells uh, and also uh, it's under commercialization for water electrolyzer. So we borrowing such concept of MEA into our CO2 electrolysis and we can work on a larger area of five centimeters square. Of course, we are trying to further on um, uh, working on 25 and 100 centimeters square uh, uh, MEA device. And uh, but uh, here we showcase the results from five centimeters square. And we found that uh, the selectivity remains the same and the voltage is not so bad. And we use, using this um, device, MEA device, we evaluate the stability of the material. And we found that uh, Within around like 60 hours, the selectivity of SD remains stable and we can be able to generate around 28 liter of um, uh, SD. Uh, actually, this is quite remarkable uh, because this is an emerging technology. So, but you may ask us, why do we stop here? Because everything is looking promising. The, the current density is stable and the selectivity is stable. So the reason we stop here is that uh, the device is blocked by some salt in the gas channel or uh, in the gas channel, so that the CO two is not accessible by the catalyst. Then we can have to generate uh, we have to generate uh, hydrogen instead. So that means the cell is dead. So we are wondering why the CO the cell is dead. So we do the carbon balance analysis. So. Here, actually, uh, you don't need to panic. Here is actually just the, uh, the schematic of the MEA device. So when we are doing the uh, reaction, we need to have the CO2, of course, have the CO2 to flow through the uh, reactor and we collect the product um, at the end of the, uh, at the cathode side. Uh, but at the end of the side, we need to supply electrolyte in order to uh, in order for the ions and the electrons to uh, fly through the uh, reactor. So we use, uh, usually we use the bicarbonate, uh, sodium bicarbonate. And then if we write down the equations for this reaction, actually this is quite straightforward. At the cathode, cathode side, we have the CO2 uh, reduction reaction to generate uh, ethylene. But at the same time, we generate quite a number of OH ions, and we know that OH ions is basic CO2 as acidic, so they will react together to become carbonate. And carbonate, uh, we know that uh, it contains uh, sodium. So carbonate uh, here will combine with uh, uh, potassium once it, uh, the concentration uh, of the potassium carbonate exceeds its solubility, it will form precipitate. So that's the reason why we observe uh, precipitant here, so it blocks the channel. And uh, more seriously, there is another challenge for the carbon from the carbonate because the carbonate will uh, will cross the 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 membrane uh, and reach the anode side. So at the anode side, we know that we have the OER reaction uh, for water splitting, but at the same time we generate a proton, and we know that the proton reacts with carbonate and bicarbonate so that it releases CO2. That means if we want, we feed all the CO2 here and we expected that all the CO2 will become product. But the reality is that the CO2 will not only be converted into product, but also be crossed over the membrane to the end of the side and emit uh, together with oxygen. So uh, if we do further calculation, we found that uh, 75% of CO2 actually will go over the crossover way to the end of the side. And uh, actually only, that means only at most 25% of CO2 will be converted to uh, the final product we want. And also the, gen the 
CO2 at the anode side will be a mixture of oxygen. That means if we want to recycle the CO2 back to the cathode, we need to pay some extra cost for the gas separation. And uh, this is actually, we call it a CO2 crossover and the carbonate formation problem. Due to crossover, we'll add the separation cost and the carbonate formation will uh, like uh, we'll block the gas uh, channel to kill the device. And also actually, if we do the technical economical analysis, we found that the CO2 crossover or CO2 loss actually kills the economical viability of the CO2 uh, reduction reaction. Because here, of course, this is the lab da data and this is the cost of estimating the lab data currently uh, uh, available in the lab. So it actually shows a uh, very bad uh, uh, cost of ethylene, this is quite high. But if we have the very open, optimistic conditions for the MEA device, that means we have very high selectivity, we have very low uh, voltage, we have very high uh, production rates. Even at this case, we found that this purple uh, color indicates the separation of oxygen and uh, uh, CO2 and the carbonate formation, uh, formation cause the uh, actual cost. We found that uh, with that cost from CO2 loss, we will not compete with the existing um, ethylene production uh, approach from fossil fuel, which generates a, a, a ethylene cost around a thousand uh, US dollar per ton. That means we have to address the cost uh, caused by CO2 loss. So how can we do that? So we currently, we are working on two different uh, strategies. One is that we can separate the CO2 to ethylene conversion into two steps, which is C which are CO2 to CO and the CO2 to ethylene, and we can make a tandem reactor. So the reason we do the tandem reactor is that in the first step, CO2 to CO, we can use the high temperature solid oxide electrolysis device, which does not involve protons and uh, water so that we do not have the uh, OH uh, ion generation uh, problem so that CO2 will not react, uh, will not have the chance to react with CO2 with, uh, with OH to form uh, carbonate. So using this strat strategy, we can generate the CO in a very uh, energy efficient way and using the CO to feed the normal MEA device, we can drive the CO2 acidine uh, reaction. And uh, the reason we use CO is that CO is not an acidic uh, gas. It does not react reacts with OH. So using this step, in this step, we do not have OH generated. In this step, CO does not react with OH. So that the uh, overall process does not have a uh, carbonate formation problem, does not have a CO2 cross over problem. And we uh, found that using our Catalyst, so we can generate a similar uh, energy efficiency for the tandem uh, uh, reactor, reactor, and also we can have a very high uh, selectivity. So this is one strategy to use tandem reactor. Another strategy is that we can operate a CO2 reduction in acidic condition. So we know that CO2 will react with alkaline, but uh, if we can operate the reaction under acidic con conditions, that means we do not have uh, alkaline, uh, the or the OH uh, challenge. So here actually is a schematic for neutral conditions. We know that we have the carbonate formation problem. That means we expect to generate CO2 at the anode mixed with oxygen. And the experimental data shows that we have a lot of CO2 together with oxygen. And if we convert it into acidic condition, that means we have protons to transport to the membrane. We do not have OH ions. We do not have carbonate ions. And we found that uh, under our, the defecation limit of our equipment, we do not observe uh, CO at the end of the side. But for the cathode side, our intention is to reduce CO2. But what we observe is only hydrogen evolution. Actually, this is not so difficult to understand because we are working under strong acidic conditions and the reduction of proton is much easier and we have a lot of protons. So we expect to generate a lot of hydrogen uh, from cathode. So how can we suppress the competing proton reduction while improve the 
CO2 reduction. So our strategy is to create a locally non-acidic condition. So let me explain the concept. So the bulk solution is still strong uh, acid uh, with a pH below uh, one. But uh, when we are operating the reaction at the cathode with a very high production rate, that means we have the chance to consume all the protons available at the cathode. So that means we are creating purposely a traffic jam of uh, protons. The proton is not just not far enough to like uh, to reach the surface of the catalyst uh, to be consumed. That means the local con environment is a proton poor, while the bulk condition is a uh, proton rich. So that means we have created a local environment with high pH, while the bulk environment is low pH. So we model our concept with uh, like a console modeling. And we uh, what we model is that we uh, work out the pH around the, uh, the, 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 the cathode and, uh, and the different applied uh, current density. And then we found that uh, the, here, the dashed line is the uh, pKa of uh, carbonic acid. Uh, so that means we, if the pH is above this dashed line, we will have the chance to uh, for the CO2 to react with OH to become carbonate and bicarbonate. And it's be, if it's below the pH, CO2 will uh, present in the form of CO2 molecule. So that means this area, uh, you can see the uh, uh, the pH is uh, higher for blue color. This area is kind of like a spot, a sweet spot for uh, our working condition because under this area, the local pH is higher than the pKa and, and the, while in the bulk condition, the pH is below, um, pK, uh, below the pKa, that means here we have the quite relatively alkaline condition. Here we have the uh, acidic condition. So once we have, we form the, even we form the CO bicarbonate here, once bicarbonate diffuse across this line, it will uh, encounter a lot of protons and the low pH so that it will, it will be converted back into CO2 molecular so that it can reach back to the surface for the further reaction. So that means even if we generate a carbonate, it only happens uh, locally around the cathode. So we have a chance to convert the carbonate back into uh, acid. So we test our modeling by doing experiments and we use different pH, like pH 1 to pH 4. And uh, we found that for pH 2 and pH 4, we can observe the uh, much reduced uh, of hydrogen uh, evolution reaction, but for pH one, what we observe is still only hydrogen. So how can we understand this phenomenon? So we still seek uh, to our modeling uh, result. We found that if we look at the dashed line, so we model the, the, the pH at different current density and about different bulk pH. If we look at the dashed line, so at the same current density, we found that uh, if we have a bulk pH more acidic, we will have a more acidic local environment. Uh, the pH is only around uh, six. But if we have a, like a, a bulk dish uh, pH uh, less acidic, we will have much higher local pH, uh, which is around uh, like a 10. So this may kind of explain why and the different and the higher pH we observe reduce hydrogen evolution, but under uh, and the uh, uh, pH one, we do not observe uh, hydrogen evolution, but uh, is that the real case? So if if we look at uh, this dash, uh, this uh, rectangle, this rectangle uh, area, we found that uh, this is area is around the, uh, indicate the same pH, but under different uh, 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 current density. We found that for achieving the similar pH. For like a pH one, a pH two, three, and four, you need to only have like a current density below two hundred uh, uh, milliampere per centimeter square. So that means this 
these two columns and these two columns. So we observe the decreased hydrogen evolution. This is understandable. But here, if we look at the pH bulk pH one, so the pH of the local pH is roughly the same as other bulk pHs. And in order to achieve this pH, you only need to have a current density of 200, 300, and 400. So that means it's actually this column and this column. So if we, this column works for reduced uh, uh, proton reduction, this, col this data point should also work. That yeah. means here the column height should be much lower because we, do, we, we, we can still have some CO2 re uh, being reduced while suppression of hydrogen evolution, but this is not the case. So why um, we have the local alkaline conditions, but we do not have CO2 reduction. So we look at the recipe of our uh, electrolytes. So how we prepare the pH one, two, three, four electrolytes, actually we mix uh, phosphoric acid with a certain amount of, of uh, dihydrogen uh, phosphate uh, salt, and we, Look at if we look at here, so pH two we have 0.5 molar uh, potassium um, dihydrogen phosphate for pH three we have 0.9 molar for pH four we have one molar. So we are thinking that maybe the potassium uh, cation has, uh, does also play a role because this is not our own unique finding. At that time, some research groups had already identified that potassium may play a role. So to uh, test this hypothesis. We do the experiment. We first test the CO2 reduction using one molar phosphoric acid without potassium. And, and of course, what we observe is only hydrogen. We do not observe any CO2 reduction product. And during the reaction, when we add the 0.5 molar uh, potassium chloride, we found that decrease of hydrogen evolution while increase. We, uh, uh, we detect some uh, methane product from the CO2 reduction. So it seems that uh, it works. So uh, the straightforward thought is that we add further uh, concentrate of potassium into the electrolyte and we do the test of 0.5 all the way to three uh, molar potassium mm -hmm. concentration. And what we found that we can see a continuous decrease of hydrogen evolution while increase of uh, CO2 reduction. And also we found that with more potassium, we will get more C2 products. So we are thinking that maybe we can further improve the concentration of potassium so that we can get more C2 products. But unfortunately for most of potassium, the solubility is a problem. And for most of the salts, um, it has a very low solubility of around the three molar. So how can we achieve a very high concentration of potassium? So what we are doing is that we try to develop a cation automating layer. So in this layer, it's a kind of polymer layer. We separate the layer with potassium, and then we attach the layer on the surface of catalyst. And this layer can have the capability of storing quite a number of potassium so that we create a very locally concentrated potassium nearby the co copper catalyst. That means we break uh, uh, the like uh, solubility of potassium in solution, but we store the solu uh, potassium in the polymer matrix. So using this CAL strategy, we can achieve a very high C2, pro C2 product selectivity while suppressing our hydrogen and uh, C1 product, which is uh, missing. So actually the, the our, how to go for doing this acidic CO2 condition uh, rea rea reaction is to mitigate the carbon loss because we know that carbon loss is a, a huge problem. To mitigate the carbon loss, that means to in improve the carbon conversion efficiency. So how can we achieve our goal? The first thing is that we can eat more CO2, feeding CO2. That means we operate the reaction under higher current density so that we have two benefits. One, we improve the production rate. Two, we create a higher local pH so that we can uh, promote the C2 product uh, selectivity. Another thing is that we feed less CO2. That means we decrease the uh, flow rate of feeding CO2 uh, by doing so. And at uh, like three SCCM of CO2 flow rate, we can achieve the single pass CO2 conversion rate of 77%. Actually, this breaks the theoretical limit of 25 in neutral conditions. So we can have the chance to utilize CO2 more and to convert more CO2 into uh, pro product. 
So finally, we come to the conclusion and the outer loop. So here, I I like to use the uh, technical economic analysis of the uh, one step MEACO2 to actually electrolyze um, and because this tell us a lot of information. So we know that the product cost can be break down into several different parameters like electrolyzer, capital electrolyzer operation, cathode separation, anode separation. And actually these parameters can be linked back to the fundamental uh, par uh, parameters of our electrolyzer. For example, the electrolyzer called capital is linked to current density, durability, Electrolyzer operation can be linked to electric electricity price for device voltage and Faraday efficiency. So I will not name all of them. So what we have been doing well is that the electricity price, uh, at least in Australia, we see a drastic decrease of electricity price because of the like uh, more deployment of solar panels on our, our rooftop. And also the current density actually is uh, working very well currently the current density is comparable to the commercialized uh, fuel cell uh, applications. And uh, uh, we have been doing a lot of work to improve the Faraday efficiency, which is the selectivity. Uh, so here in, uh, in the copper PTA, I show you an example to how, how we improve the uh, ethylene and the C2 product selectivity. So, and a lot of more uh, researchers are working on this area. And also we have been starting to work on how we can improve the CO2 conversion efficiency to reduce the CO2 crossover. And this is just the starting of our work. And we have still, uh, we still have a lot of work to do on this aspect. Uh, what is lacking currently for the CO2 electrolysis is how we can improve the durability. Uh, actually the durability is very complicated because of the catalyst, because of, of the full device. So in, this talk I demonstrated to you uh, around the third, uh, 70 hour operation, but this is just not enough. In order for the reaction to be commercialized, we need to run for several thousand hours and there is still a long way to go. So uh, actually we, with chemical engineering, we are still, uh, we are starting to work on this uh, topic. And uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge the funding support from ARC, from uh, the university, and also from uh, Australian Synchrotron. And also this work is uh, enabled by collaboration with um, Professor Jie Zhang, Associate Professor, uh, Assistant Professor Song Fu Fang, and Professor Ted Te Sarnin from China, Taiwan, and uh, uh, Canada. So thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, please just feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Actually, uh, this is a very good question because I have limited time, so I did not pre present to the technical economic uh, aspects of this work. So we indeed have done the analysis. We found that uh, even if we needed to pay, uh, of course, a bit more money to the electricity process, uh, electricity because we now separate one device into two devices, uh, we this is unavoidable. What we can save money is from the, like. Uh, separation parts for the anode, which is caused by CO2 crossover. We do not have CO2 crossover. Another part we can see money is from the, actually the cathode separation. 
can, we do not have the formation of carbonate and also using the high temperature reactor, reactor we can achieve very high single pass CO2 conversion. That means in the out in the outlet stream, we have much more uh, concentrated products of CO and we have less CO2. That means it's always easy to separate one like a predominant uh, uh, product from the mixture. It's difficult to, if you have a, like a concentration of just a 0.1 percentage, it's so difficult to get out the 0.1 percentage. If you have like 90, then it's much easier and cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really an interesting question because uh, I have been consistently asked by several like industry partner and also like the CDIP office to see whether we have a patent for this. We have uh, we have the like a plan to scale up the technology. I think this is the end way. The only thing constraining us is that we do not just have enough students to work on scaling up. And also another challenge is that when you are working on projects that is closer to commercialization or closer to uh, to uh, like uh, engineering part, you will have less chance to publish, right? So we need, the, the my job is to persuade the student to take such task to showcase that we can actually make our catalyst work in a larger scale so that we can convince the company to uh, like reach out, uh, reach out to us uh, more frequently. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in, in my uh, last page, I kind of analyze what we where we need to work in order for this process to be commercialized. I think it, we have been doing great job for the selectivity for the CO two utilization. What we need to persuade the industry to improve the durability of our catalyst, even if you have very complicated or even fancy material, if it does not last. Then the con industry does not uh, like your like a concept or your device. So what we have been working very hard is that whether we can develop a material, whether no matter it's complicated or it's very simple, but we want to keep the materials easy to be synthesized and uh, with low cost, and uh, it works for a longer time. This is the material side, and another side is that. Uh, as I said, the device side. So the durability is not only about the material itself, it's about the device. So if you have the carbonate formation, definitely you will not work for a long time. So we need to make the catalyst work in not only in the traditional CO2 reduction reaction in neutral condition, we need to make the catalyst work under acidic condition so that we can directly avoid the carbonate formation problem. Thank you, Mick. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's but that's uh sometimes we learn from like uh, nature from biology because we know that we have some enzyme which can accelerate the interconversion between CO two and the bicarbonate. So that means we have the chance to keep the local pH or keep the bulk pH and uh, actually. Um, in this year, there are like a nature chemistry paper published that they are using such enzyme to tune the CO2 reduction reaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's frozen. <laughs> I try to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um. You really have a good observation. So I know the you can see aggregation. So the aggregation actually is not uh, the signal from intermediate, but uh, the formation of carbonates and the bicarbonates locally. Oh. Yeah, because their Raman signal is just around one thousand and around one thousand and twenty. Yeah. Yeah, the longer time you operate the reaction, you will have more CO2 to be reacted with the OH. That's a very good question. Mm-hmm. 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 